this is Lisa Elwine. I'm welcoming you back to 50,000 Degrees and Cloudy, a better resurrection. Uh, probably more than you ever wanted to know about the resurrection, but the tour is full. It's full of hints. And, you know, it's, it's very fulfilling when you can find those hints in the Torah and match them up with what's being written to us in the New Testament, in the Bich So, you know, we've been using some rules. And we know the one rule that encompasses everything is context is everything. That's right. You probably said it before I did. One of our other rules, other than context is everything, is first mention. So we want to look for the first mention of a moving cloud. If Paul is describing for us uh, this action of being gathered into the clouds, with Yeshua and dwelling there with him, we want to look for a precedent. We want to look at where was this mentioned before? And we know, of course, that we're going to find that mention, obviously, in the Torah. But let's go from Numbers 10, 11 through 13. And it's, uh, which I'll, I'll compress some of this a little bit just so that we'll pull out the key words. It says, the cloud was lifted from over the tabernacle of the testimony and the sons of Israel set out on their journeys then the cloud settled down so they moved out for the first time according to the commandment of the Lord through Moses that is so profound they moved out the first time according to the commandment of the Lord through Moses. And you can see how Moses has become a metaphor for the Torah itself. If you say Torah, you can say Moses. If you say Moses, you might be saying Torah. So the first time the cloud moves with the people in it is going to be according to the commandment of the Lord through Moses. It's going to be according to the Torah. So if we want to understand what Paul is talking about when he says, I, I'm saying to the, this to you by the word of the Lord, what word is he referring to? He's referring back to the commandment of the Lord through Moses where they set out the first time. Because if they set out that way the first time, they're going to set out that way the last time. It kind of goes back to our Passover Sukkot analogy. If this is the way it was, the very first time it was done, then this is going to be the way that it's done at the beginning. And so Paul is reassuring the Thessalonians that, hey, you know what? Go look it up. It's according to the word of the Lord. I don't want you to be uninformed. And the only way we would be uninformed is if we weren't reading the Torah and then weren't applying it to the Brit Chadashah and using that for the proper context of the Brit Chadashah. So we've got Sukkot which is the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of the Nations. It has some nicknames. Um, in Hebrew, the, the Feast of Asif or the Ingathering. Um, but it actually begins, if we're looking at these fall feasts, let's say this is Sukkot or the Feast of Ingathering, it's not really out there by itself seasonally, just like Passover is not out there by itself seasonally. It also has unleavened bread and it also has first fruits of the barley that are part of that week. In the same way, in the fall, you have a season. And that's um, another usage of the word moed. Uh, it doesn't just mean a feast or an appointed time. It can also mean a season. And so... Uh, this season of joy is really kicked off here at the Feast of Trumpets with the blowing of trumpets. You're going to count 10 days to Yom Kippur. And once the judgments are sealed up at Yom Kippur, then you are free to go into your Sukkot. So one has to follow the other. They're, they're basically one is founded on the other. You can't separate those feasts out and what's left still have a meaning connected with everything else. So Paul knows that his Jewish readers are going to have context. But again, the Thessalonians, it sounds like it was a primarily Gentile, non-Jewish audience. So he's trying to familiarize them with the word of the Lord. 
um, because they, they were looking for some solid clues to understand the resurrection. Um, obviously, there were, there were people out there who believed in different types of resurrection, even pagan religions, and then there were some who just thought, no, when you die, you die, like the Sadducees. There were more Gnostic religions that thought attainment of knowledge, that dying was a great thing because you would be free of the body. But the Pharisees were teaching a bodily resurrection. In other words, spirit, soul, and body, everything comes back together so that you return to that garden condition of being both a physical and a spiritual being. Um, and, of course, this is the resurrection that Yeshua demonstrated very graphically when he said, touch me, handle me, do you have something to eat? Uh, he wasn't a ghost, and he wanted to make sure his disciples knew he wasn't a ghost that the resurrection involves restoring you to that Edenic state where you can competently pass between both physical realms and spiritual realms. Um, time travel. If you, we look at Philip, um, what does he do? In, in one second he's in this place and then all of a sudden he's in a chariot reading the book of Isaiah um, with an Ethiopian. So when you get that resurrected body, that's a little preview. It's not quite the same as what you experience now, that there's actually being more in tune with that spiritual dimension. Um, you know, it's, without getting into sounding like we're talking about UFOs, it's much different in terms of our experience now where it's so difficult to engage the spiritual world like the prophets did, where they would have to say, open his eyes so he can see prophetically what I'm talking about. So Paul is giving his readers this, this context of the resurrection. He knows that the seeds of the resurrection are sown in the Torah. And they're going to begin on every day of creation. You're going to get some little clue from a day of creation. And we went over day five. We showed the chiastic structure of that as a resurrection day compared with day three how both of those, they come from the same place on the menorah, so they're each a, a type of resurrection day. And so in our early program, we went over that information. So we're going to go back to it for uh, just a minute here to clarify some things. Because we know day five is a resurrection day, a day of new life, because we had the birds and the fish. We had swarms of living creatures. Think about those creatures. We have these birds which are covered and feathered. Um, these feathers enable them to fly. Um, the, the text describes them as moving in swarms. All right, that's the English translation. It describes the fish as moving in swarms. So, what do we have here? We have rapidly moving creatures. In fact, the word swarm or rots, uh, it has to do with running. Uh, the, the Hebrew word or Hebrew root rots means to run. And so if you were to try to imagine day five of creation just based on the Hebrew root of the swarms, what you would visualize is like millions and millions and millions of little running feet. So this upswarm, we've got birds who go up, who ascend, and they can fly. They are not earthbound, but they can function with their feet on the ground. They can function with their feet in a tree, but they are not bound to the branches of a tree. They are not bound to, say, the marshes. Wherever a bird's habitat is, it will function equally well either on the ground or flying, although some are better than others if you've ever nearly run over a turkey on the highway. Uh, takes a little while to get that elevation there. But the picture is that they're really living in two realms. They're living in this lower realm, and then they're living in, in the heavens so to speak. So we get this upswarm 
as a picture on the fifth day is the resurrection of the dead, that yes, we are earth creatures. We can function on the physical earth. That's how we're, we, we, our old creation, we're designed to do that, to function and enjoy natural things. But we're no longer earth bound, that we can actually enter the heavens. And so we've got these multitudes, these swarms of, of birds that are visible on the fifth day of creation. And we also have the fish who are below the water. It's hard to see the fish, uh, but nevertheless, we know they're there, even though they are hidden. And that is one of the, one of the nicknames of Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, is a resurrection day. It's called the hidden day. All right. So we've got two pictures. We've got the birds that are showing us how we can be earthbound yet heavenbound, but we've got fish who show us the concealment aspect of that resurrection day. Regardless, we know that both the sea uh, and the earth are going to give up their dead that's going to happen at the resurrection, as well as those who are already alive, those who might still be walking around who are believers, they will also go up into the cloud. So those who are hidden will be caught up into the cloud, as well as those who were still flitting around, <laughs> jumping branches, I don't know what we'll be doing. But whatever we're doing, once we hear that shofar call, then we will be caught up into the clouds. And it, it's an interesting thing because the dead do come out of the dust. That's one of the pictures. Yeshua tells his disciples something interesting. He says, I'm sending you out here. I want you to preach. I want you to heal. Um, I want you to cast out demons. I want you to do all these things in my name. But he said, if a town will not receive you, he said, just shake the dust off of your feet and move on. And like you said, I think Yeshua had a sense of humor we don't always catch because we always think of, you know, reading the Bible being a very serious thing. But if you do that all the time, you'll never, I think, pick up on some of his, his double entendres and some of his humor. But if you think about it, someone who rejects the word of Adonai is dead in the dust already. So basically, the disciples, they shake the dust off their feet. What are they saying? You're dead already. Why? Because remember, the first time the cloud moved, it moved according to the commandment. It moved according to the word of the Lord. And so if they're not willing to receive that word, they're not going to be caught up. They are not going to be gathered into the cloud. So you shake the dust off your feet. You're, you're dead already if you won't receive us in his name. So we get these resurrection clues all through the first book, first five books of the Bible. But there's three of them that are so heavy with clues. We can't overlook what happens when we put these three sections together. And we say it's, it's that wilderness journey gets so much uh, real estate in the Torah scroll. So we want to pay attention to what's getting the most real estate. Most of you know that over the course of the year in synagogues, a section of the Torah is read each Shabbat, or actually during the course of the week and Shabbat. And so over the course of the year, the entire five books of Torah are read. Each of these Torah portions, these weekly portions, has a name. It has a Hebrew name based on the beginning or the opening phrases of that particular Torah portion. Like the very first one is Bereshit, because that's the first word of the Bible. Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning. So that's its name, Bereshit, in the beginning. There are three Torah portions, and I'm going to give you the Hebrew names. Beha, Alokha, that's one. Kitisa, that's two. And Pekude. That's the third one. Now, the resurrection, believe it or not, is actually in every single Torah portion. I can show it to you. Uh, or you can go to our, our website 
and you can hit our old newsletter archives and you will see at least one year of Torah teachings where each one brings out the concept of resurrection in the weekly portion. But there's three that are important to this book. And again, it's Beha Alokha, Kitisa, and Pekude. Now, I'm not just going to throw Hebrew words out there that you don't know. I'm going to tell you what they mean in English. And once you assemble those three in English, you're going to see an incredible message. You know, people like to go after these Bible codes, but there's things that are encoded in there that are much easier to find. In fact, you don't even have to do math. Uh, you can just do a simple uh, search on the Torah portions, and once you know what's in the Torah portion, then it's going to make sense. You'll get messages within messages just from reading the titles. So if I put those three Hebrew phrases together, those three titles of three Torah portions that describe the movement in the cloud in the wilderness, I can put those together, and what they will say together is, in your going up, when you elevate at the reckoning. All three of those things are associated with Rosh Hashanah, being caught up into the cloud, going into Sukkot of glory. When you elevate, right? We know Yeshua descends, but then he catches us up. We will be in an elevated state, not just in a physical way, but in an elevated spiritual state. So when you go up, into that elevated spiritual state, and the third, at the reckoning. Well, that's part of this season is the reckoning or the accounting. Remember, we said in a previous program that at Rosh Hashanah, even the rabbis recognize it's not just Israel that has to be reckoned and accounted at that time of year. It says even the nations have to go under the shepherd's staff and to be counted and reckoned at that time of year. So it's, it's given us basically GPS. We know if we put these three Torah portions together, it's going to give us a lot of information about the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of the Awakening Blast, which is pretty cool when you realize he doesn't just expect you to search through there and try to figure out, well, where did he hide this from me? He didn't really hide it from you. You can go back to the, the Hebrew names of the portions and assemble some things, and you it's almost like having a, a table of contents. Again, but much of it is conditioned, again, upon accepting that the Jews have pulled a lot of these symbols out of here the way that we looked at them in pre previous programs. And so you have to condition yourself to see those words and phrases. And once you can recognize where they found those in the text and assemble those things, then you can have fun like this. You can find these, these secret codes that really aren't secret at all. It's just a matter of reading what's there and knowing what the clues are. So. Just to recap, because I want you, you know, in your spare time, to go back to these three specific Torah portions and read through them just with the idea, I'm looking for everything I've ever learned about the resurrection in these three portions. I'm going to look specifically for that. I'm not just going to read through it like it's a story. I'm looking for the resurrection. And you'll be surprised what you find. So if you're not familiar with those portions, I'll go ahead and give them to you. You want to read Baha Alokha. Remember, it's in your going up, and it's specific to light the menorah. And remember, the menorah is connected to the appointed times and context. So in your going up, when you go up to light your menorah at the appointed times, that uh, Torah portion you'll find from Numbers 8.1 through 12.16. 
The next portion, Kitisa, when you elevate, when you lift up, is Numbers 30, 11 through 34, 35. And then Pekude, which means accounting or reckoning, is Numbers 38, 21 through 40, 38. If you'll read through those again, Looking just for that specific information, you'll probably find more things than I'll even talk about. Because I, you know, for the sake of brevity, I couldn't put everything in the book, but I could give you enough, hopefully, that you'll become excited and go to the text yourself and start to find even more things. And that's a great thing for a teacher when those who participate, the students, when they take something and they run with it and they learn to do it for themselves. So I'd like for you to start looking at that with these weekly tour portions, see if you can't find thematically where they fit in terms of the feasts. That's a challenge. So elevation and reckoning, we know are these seasonal expectations of uh, Rosh Hashanah, which leads to Yom HaKippurim, where all the judgments are sealed up by the conclusion of Yom HaKippurim, and then you go into Sukkot to enjoy the rewards and the fellowship and all that of dwelling in the cloud. Um, and like the Mishnah says, which is a Jewish um, collection of oral law commenting on the Torah, again, they're associating what we would know as Resurrection Day uh, the Feast of Trumpets, it says all the world passes under the shepherd staff for judgment on that day. So now let's go back and let's take a look again. We want to keep moving back and forth so we don't forget our context for what Paul's writing. First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 5, Paul writes, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. All right, that context right there really helps us understand why Baha Alucha and your going up is associated with the menorah and light and knowing the times and the seasons that Paul is talking about. Basically saying if you'll study the Torah, you'll this won't catch you off guard because you'll be observing those set times of Adonai. You will not be surprised when you hear a shofar call on the Feast of Trumpets. You'll know what that's for. But by the same token, you'll also know that times of destruction are part of this process. That, again, this is a season of judgment. And so while the righteous are waiting to hear the shofar, again, so that they can enter into clouds of glory, so that they can go into Sukkot. There are going to be people who hate Adonai, hate his people, hate his appointed times, don't want to hear it. And he says tribulation is going to come upon them. Well, remember at Passover, we came out of Egypt. We came out of Mitzrayim. We came out of tribulations to go into the clouds of glory. But he says in this passage, there's going to be people who will not escape, just like the Egyptians did not escape if they didn't put the blood on their doorpost. They were stuck in their own wickedness. And so part of that process obviously was deep darkness. There was a plague with the tangible darkness. But Paul is saying, we are of the day and we are of the light. So with this menorah, with the power of the Holy Spirit in you, and you're going up to light the menorah every single day. Remember, you had to light it twice a day. 
So in that lighting, there was no night. If, if you light that menorah in the evening, then the light will fill up the darkness. So the children who were of the day, you light your menorah, you're full of the power of the Holy Spirit, you're observing the appointed times with the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's like, and you're going up. These are the people, he said, I'm gathering you up, I'm taking you up. Why? Because you have tended your menorah day after day after day after day because you're a child of the day, not of darkness. You don't let these things go out by night. It's part of who you are. And so this day can't overtake you as a thief. It can't. Because you're preparing every single day by tending the menorah. And how do you get oil for the menorah? You crush the olive. So... That means knowing Yeshua and the fellowship of his suffering. The more the suffering for the sake of the kingdom, the more the olive oil is pressed out and the brighter your menorah shines. And the more likely it is to make it through the night, unlike the foolish virgins who really hadn't experienced that crushing, so they didn't have enough oil to make it through the night. They could only make it about halfway. Now, what does that mean in terms of their, their future reward? I don't know. Uh, that's up to the judge. But this season is about judgment. And the day he's talking about here is Rosh Hashanah. When that last trump, when the shofar sounds, when the silver trumpets sound, then it's going to call the elect from the four corners of the earth for the resurrection of the dead. Ten days later is Yom Kippur. You say, well, why is there such a time lapse between gathering, the beginning of the gathering, and then the sealing up of these judgments of who is righteous, who is wicked, who's somewhere in between, so that from there we can go on into the reward that has been prepared to us according to how we have been judged, according to the books. In fact, Yom, ha Yom Kippur is actually Yom HaKippurim, Day of Atonements, Day of Coverings. Um, but it, it begins on Rosh Hashanah. So there's a 10-day um, period called the Days of Ah, or the Ten Terrible Days. It, it suggests that it, it won't be a great period for a lot of people. Um, but the decrees that are made on Rosh Hashanah are sealed up at the conclusion of Yom Kippur. So that suggests that if there is a gathering at Rosh Hashanah, it will happen apparently instantaneously. But remember, those extra 10 days are to give you time to repent. It's possible. We're not saying this is the way it is, but it's possible that there will be people who realize what has happened and they will realize they've only got 10 days to repent and to be added to the cloud until the judgment is sealed up. Now that might be controversial, but that's attempting to deal with the pattern of the feast itself. So that if you were hopping from this branch to that, if you were living on the edge, if you, you know, basically righteous, but, you know, you got your branches hanging over, hanging over here in a place where they really shouldn't be, you've got 10 days to get yourself together until the doors close at the conclusion of Yom Kippur, because that's when those books are going to be sealed up. There's not really any change following that point. Um, so, just to summarize, uh, we see that there's going to be completely righteous people who are resurrected into the cloud on the day, on the Feast of Trumpets. Possibly we have intermediates not really committed. They have 10 days to repent. And then we have a third class of people that Scripture describes who are completely wicked, who don't want to repent. They would rather the mountains fall on them and the rocks fall on them to ever repent. Those would be completely wicked, and if their reward 
is that punishment, then that's exactly what they wanted. So in the next program, we'll try to unpack that a little more.